The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Standing here, using this window as a light box in order to trace my graphic novel about a sloth who becomes a gladiator, really makes my pack hurt. Plus the window's cold because it's winter outside. If only there was a better way. Huh? Uh, why do I gotta be tech support for all my friends and family? Felix, are you okay? I heard some sort of guttural noise coming from out here. Uh, ben, I'm trying to figure out what to do with all these laptops and netbooks I've collected. Yeah, I know how you feel. I'm trying to figure out how to trace a sloth using the window as a light box. Hmm. Wait a minute. These are kind of like boxes with light coming out of them. What if we tore apart these laptops, tried to find as many working screens as we could, and embedded them into a table to create a light box? Brilliant idea! Let's rip these things apart. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. This episode's challenge is to make an art light box using old laptop LCD screens. A light box is something where you have light underneath and you can trace and do art on top of it. It's kind of old school, but it's still pretty handy. I'd like to have one. Here's our plan. We're gonna take apart some old laptops and find suitable screens from them. If they're old laptops, the screens might be damaged or cracked, so we won't know until we get in there. Then we will find the inverter pinouts to manually light the display. The inverter is a little circuit that actually causes the display to light up. We don't need the laptop in order to make that happen, but we still will have to reverse engineer it a little bit. Then we'll build an angled art desk to install the LCDs into. We'll recess the LCDs into the desk and also recess glass on top of them. And then finally, if everything works, we'll trace things. Let's get started. Felix has obtained many laptops over the years and we raided his box of laptops in order to find a good LCD screen candidate. So what I think we're gonna be looking for, Felix, is a screen that has a very obvious distinction between its data lines and its power lines. That way, if we find some nice juicy power lines, we can think, oh, if we apply power to that, the screen will turn on. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, let's try that. Okay, let's see what we can find. <laughs> This reminds me of those people that like eat hot dogs in a competition, you know? <laughs> but instead of hot dogs, we have a bunch of laptops. So don't eat them. Eat a laptop. <laughs> I will not be eating laptops today, sir. <laughs> hey, check this out. There oh. is a power inverter. Nice, score. All right, so looks like this has a single lamp, see? and one input. Yeah, that's a good score. And this is nice because we can easily detach it from the rest of the laptop, which means we don't have to take apart the rest of the laptop. Sweet. Felix wins round one. <laughs> Disassemble. There. Make sure you know which screen that went with. You wanna pull the screen out too? Oh yeah. <clears throat> You know, even back when this thing was being made, everything was glued together. Hey, look at this, another nice juicy obvious inverter. See these two cables coming in? One is data and one is power for the inverter, so that's good. Um, it's probably not just power though, there's probably a control like a brightness, like mm -hmm. enable and brightness, just like those other units, so. Still, that's good. Felix, we've become scrappers, we can make YouTube channels. Oh, I got it, I got it. A scrapper who completes video games in speed runs. <laughs> I'm gonna make all the ad money. Oh, look at that, hey, look at this one, Felix. This one's really nicely labeled, look at that. See? Oh. It's got four differential pairs. We could hook this up to a FPGA without too much difficulty. It's even got labeled test points, look at that. That is nice. We've taken apart the screens, let's see what we've got. We've selected what we believe to be the best candidates for our LCD backlight project. We discovered the bulbs are fairly agnostic. You can plug any bulb into any inverter and as long as both of them work, it'll light up. The inverters are mostly the same. We found 
this one that works from a laptop, remember these are all dead laptops, so there's no guarantee any of this was going to work. This one does function. We have three over here that don't. This one looks intact, but we just couldn't get it to fire up. This one we couldn't find the pinout for. This one appears to have actually sustained damage. Perhaps the laptop was dropped. We also found these off Amazon, I believe, or no, eBay. These are basically generic inverters, and they have pinouts labeled, but the wire colors are all wrong. They have 12 volts going to red, enable is yellow, it's kind of confusing, but at least it's listed. So we can do some experimentation with those as well. It looks like these can actually power two bulbs, so these might be a good bet. Um, some LCDs have a bulb at the bottom and the top, some just have one bulb, and of course, all modern ones are LED. This is what a CFL or compact fluorescent lamp looks like. It's basically a miniaturized version of a fluorescent lamp that might be in your home. And one of the reasons, you know, they're getting rid of these with laptops, besides, you know, having to have the inverter circuitry and higher power requirements, is there is mercury inside of this, just like a fluorescent bulb. Although apparently fluorescent twisty bulbs in the home are just fine. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you ask me, but whatever. So what happens is you have one of these guys down at the bottom of your screen, and then there's a diffusion element that actually pulls the light in this direction and then brings it forward. Some of these have, you know, like if we were to illuminate this one, this would light up as well. So basically there's one bulb at the bottom that lights up the whole thing evenly. And with a LED modern screen, there would just be a roll of LEDs here and perhaps one at the top as well. By reading data sheets online and cross-referencing it with the silk screen markings on all the inverter boards, we have found a pretty common set of signals. They almost always have 12 volts or some higher voltage coming in. There's an enable line. It's usually anything above three volts. So if the enable line goes high, the system turns on, the bulb turns on. There's an analog adjust brightness pin. It's usually 2.5 to five volts TTL. If that drops below 2.5 volts, it will also turn off the enable line. And even if the enable line is high, you have to pulse enable down to zero and back up to five volts in order to turn it back on. So we need to make sure that if we do have an adjustable brightness knob, we never let the brightness get below 2.5. And of course, ground. The reason it's called an inverter is because it's taking a DC voltage and turning it into an AC voltage. There's also a transformer on here, which increases the voltage, sometimes up to 1,000 to 2,000 volts. So if you touch it, you know, there's not a lot of current, you're not gonna hurt yourself, but you'll definitely notice. I think we're ready to take these to the bench and start testing them. There's a header on the inverter. I'm gonna plug it into our breadboard to test. So we got 12 volts, enable, adjust, and ground. I have to remember that the <laughs> yellow wire isn't 12 volts, it's enable. So that's why I made sure they're in the right order. Earlier we mentioned that we can't dip below 2.5 volts for the adjust voltage. So what we'll do is we'll have a 10K resistor going to ground. Then we'll have a potentiometer going to five volts. And the wiper, the potentiometer, that's what will actually go to adjust. That way we can go from 2.5 volts to five volts, but never below 2.5 volts. And just in case, I'm gonna put a push button on the enable line in case we have to pulse it. All right, time to put this together. Let's talk about what this is before we try it out. We have ground here. Our potentiometer acting as a voltage divider here. Five volt line basically just being used for logic purposes. 12 volts coming in to power it. And we have our enable button. So if we turn down the brightness too far and the screen turns off, we can tap enable briefly to ground to turn the screen back on. I've got two screens hooked up. Let's see if it works. I'm gonna use my bench power supply. All right, looks like they're turning on. They're not super bright because they still have the LCD glass in front of them. I've got a potentiometer here to adjust the brightness. Low voltage is a bright screen. Five volt is a dimmer screen. Some of the inverters, you couldn't go too high or low on the brightness without turning off the whole thing, but you can apparently go the full gamut. So I can go all the way to ground or all the way to five volts. And there is a difference, although we'll probably want them as bright as possible. Now it's time for a tech timeout. 
Here's the Apple One replica that we built a few months ago. We didn't have time to get the keys fully functional or functioning nicely during that episode, but since then, I've gone back to it and fixed it. What I did was I found a certain density of foam that has the right property to add a little bit of spring to the keys. And I laser cut a whole bunch of little square spacers and also some inserts to make the keys a lot better than they were. So you can actually type on it now without wanting to cry. So let's see, let's just try this. Let's go into basic. I mean, you still might wanna cry for other reasons, but hopefully this keyboard doesn't cause that. Hello world. Yeah, all right. So now the keyboard has been greatly improved and the Apple One replica is even better. some of the light is being blocked by the LCD. So let's remove it and see if it makes a difference. Remember, this isn't supposed to be a screen. This is supposed to just be a big square of, or rectangle of light. Do not touch the white tape, sensitive area. I'm going to take that to mean that I should touch the white tape. Usually where you see a warning label or something, that's usually an indicator of how to take something apart. Oh no, the white tape bandit strikes again. Whoever wrote this saw me using a knife on it. They would be like, oh, <laughs> nobody listens to me. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to break the glass on this. The edges of it are what we had to watch out for. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's see if there's any difference. Yeah, that's a lot better. Here are both pieces with the LCD glass removed. Now they're even brighter, even though this one's kind of yellow. Oh well, they were free. Now we can start building our light table. We finished the table design, now we can route it. All right, it's done. Time to sand it off. I'm gonna sand these quite a bit to help them fit into the grooves. These pieces are gonna slot together, allegedly. Putting the desk at an angle of 22 degrees. desk. There's a groove here. This is for the Wacom tablet to sit into so you can have it propped up and it won't roll off the table. Here's where your cables and wires can go. And of course, this is where the light box will be. I'm going to reinforce this by putting two by two beams between the legs. I'm pre-drilling the holes to keep the two by two from splitting.
going to paint the inside of this so it looks cool. That's the only reason. That and contrast. Contrast, yeah. We're doing it for contrast. See, we can replace all the dust in the air with paint fumes. That's the way to go. Once this dries, we can stain it. I've carefully selected the perfect stain for this project. My criteria, whatever we had the most of left. That room doesn't have a lot of light in it, so I don't wanna go too dark with the color. Cause you want, you know, light to bounce off of it. This looks pretty good. I've got my little pencil holders here. So gravity will not cause them to fall off the table. Just make smooth, even brush strokes. Happy little clouds. Back and forth. Oh, it's a bunny. Hi, bunny. Stain brings out the color of the wood that was always there. You just couldn't see it. Always make sure you go with the grain of the wood. I went with a slightly smaller brush for this project because, you know, I knew there were crannies and nooks that I would want to get the stain into to release every part of the trees. So... Everything is working. I'm going to take what I have on this board and actually build it onto this, so I only have one board. I'm not even gonna use a power switch. Basically, you just plug it in and it goes. That way, this thing isn't drawing any current whatsoever when the lights aren't on. It's green. All right, now I'm gonna go for it. I've combined the control circuitry with the inverter. Now we can install it under the table. I'm gonna attach this between the two screens with the cord in the back so it's closer to the wall to plug in. I wanna make sure everything is clean before I install the glass. I even made special slots for the wiring to go. Yay, they light up. Kind of hard to see in this bright room, but they do light up. Before applying the glass, I'm going to tape the edges. There are several diffusion layers, and I want to make sure that we're not going to get dust in between them later on. So I'm just going to put a thin strip of scotch tape around the edges just to hold the layers in place. I'm going to make sure the glass is clean and then install it. Still some wet stain on the bottom. All right, let's put this light table in its new home. Now I can fulfill my dreams of tracing photos of sloths. This is Slothicus. He was once a noble prince, but then Joachim Phoenix sold him into servitude and he had to become a gladiator sloth in the sloth arena. Then Joachim Phoenix went crazy they made a rap album. Yeah, this light table works pretty good. One of the um, backlights is more yellow than white, but uh, at least with this crappy paper I have here, that the yellow one actually seems to work better. I mean, I don't have proper tracing paper, or onion paper, but yeah, I can definitely see what I'm doing. All right. There it is, my first sloth drawing. I could work at a carnival now. For this episode, our challenge was to convert useless old laptops into a light box for artists. It worked out pretty well. The colors of the two LCDs didn't quite match, but hey, we recycled old parts and made a new desk to boot. It was fun to trace a sloth on the light box, and it would have worked even better had I bothered to use the proper paper. I'm sure this desk will be a useful tool for future episodes and projects. I wish I would have used a different, slightly less inclined angle for the art desk. 22 degrees was a little steep. The glass also didn't fit as nice as I wanted, but hey, at least it worked. What would you have done differently in this build? 
Have you ever found any use for old laptops before? Let us know in the Element 14 community. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be going beyond single-handed game controllers and make a single-handed pinball machine controller add-on. We'll see you then. Our challenge was to convert old useless laptops into a light box for sketch artists. It worked. <laughs> what did he look like, ma'am? <laughs> did his eyebrows look like this? Because we need trees. Have you ever found a use for old laptops before? Let us know in the Element 14 community. If, if I can change, then you can change. We all can change. Useless old laptops into light boxes for sketch artists. <laughs> Damn it! By putting a darker color under a lighter color, we will emphasize the lighter color, adding to the vertical height of the piece. Uh, this battery's worth the sand. Well, it's done, goodbye. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.